Rob Stark is dead, right? I mean, of course he's dead. We all remember the gut punch that is the Red Wedding when the phrase peppered him with arrows and then Loose Roos Bolton delivered the final jab to the King the North's heart. His mother Catelyn Stark's tortured scream slitting the throat of Jingle Bell Frey and then Cat being murdered as well. To add insult to murder, his head was cut off and Grey Wind sewed onto Rob's neck for a grisly parade of the slain king. And yet death is not really the finality in Westeros that it is in our real world. Within days of her own death, Catelyn Stark rose from the dead when Beric Dondarrion gave her the last kiss. An undead revenant has become known for her reign of terror throughout the Riverlands as Lady Stoneheart. So what about the young wolf? Could he be brought back from the abyss and live again as a king of winter? Maybe Rob Stark is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is slightly alive. Undeath is obviously possible in Westeros, it's used in the opening chapter of the series. A grave in A Song of Ice and Fire is maybe the least welcome place for a corpse. We have the others in their whites, Cold Hands, Jon Snow, whatever Gregor Clegane is these days, and many more. And the most relevant examples, Lord Beric Dondarrion and Rob Stark's undead mother, Catelyn Stark. Beric Dondarrion died at the Mummer's Ford early on in the series after being ambushed by Gregor Clegane and his men, and is personally impaled on a lance by the mountain. However, the Red Priest Thoros of Mir quickly performs the last kiss on Beric after his death, and the Lightning Lord miraculously turns to life with a nasty scar from the lance. Thoros performed the ancient rite without expectation that it would ever work, and then goes on to bring Beric back from the dead another five times. In common between these is that Thoros administered the last kiss pretty quickly after Beric died, creating the expectation in the reader that maybe this only works for a limited time. This was proven incorrect when Catelyn Stark rose from the dead as well. After the Red Wedding, Catelyn's corpse is stripped naked and dumped into the Green Fork beneath the twins, intended as an insult to her and her family. Normally, the Tullys are buried by being placed in a boat wearing fine clothes, which is then lit on fire by a flaming arrow shot from the shore. The Freys dump her body unceremoniously in the river as a sneering revenge at the Tully family ritual. There her body stayed for three days, floating down the Green Fork until, in a truly bizarre sequence, Arya's long-lost direwolf Nymeria smells Catelyn and pulls her corpse from the river. Even more bizarre, this happens while Arya is warding the direwolf in her sleep. And then, led presumably by the dreams of the ghost of Highheart, Beric Dondarrion and the Brotherhood Without Banners come upon the scene and chase Nymeria and her wolf pack off from the body. What happens next is strange to say the least. Thoros of Mir relates the tale. The fray slashed her throat from ear to ear. When we found her by the river, she was three days dead. Harwin begged me to give her the kiss of life, but it had been too long. I would not do it, so Lord Beric put his lips to hers instead, and the flame of life passed from him to her, and she rose. May the Lord of Light protect us. She rose. For our purposes in this video, this establishes that even a three-day-old rotting corpse with a slashed throat can be brought back by Thoros or Beric. Altogether, the message is clear from George. There may be no limits for reanimation with the state of the body or time after death for the creation of Fire Whites. Ice Whites, those controlled by the others, also seemingly have no limits and sometimes are no more than skeletons with scraps of skin. This is a roundabout way of saying that if Rob Stark's body is out there, it is possible he could return from the realm of the dead. This presents a problem though related through Thoros of Mir to Arya Stark. Catelyn's body is more or less intact, just with some gruesome wounds and some decomposition from the river. Rob had his head cut from his shoulders, so is it possible he could return? Arya asks a similar question when she is with the Brotherhood Without Banners and witnesses Beric's resurrection following his duel with the Hound, Sandor Clegane. Could you bring back a man without a head? Arya asked. Just the once, not six times. Could you? Arya felt tears well in her eyes. Thoros used a lot of words, but all they meant was no. That much she understood. 
Arya is wondering about bringing back her father, Ned, who also famously had his head cut off. Thoros says a very gentle no, and presumably his issue with it beyond not knowing if it would work is that without a head, what exactly would be coming back to life? Just a body without a head? He has seen from Beric that while some injuries heal with the last kiss, not all. Beric has kept signs of most of his fatal injuries so far, and they don't heal afterwards. Long story short, the body he tries to resurrect is not going to regrow a head. So if you want to try it, you probably need the head and the body, and maybe some strong sewing skills. Beyond that, why would anyone want to at this point bring back Robb Stark? The Starks have been scattered to the winds, the northern army is broken, and the Boltons rule in Winterfell. The War of the Five Kings is over, and no amount of magic will change that. Except... The war is not over for one group and their leader, Catelyn Stark also known as Mother Merciless, the Hanged Woman, the Silent Sister, Lady Stoneheart. After her resurrection by Beric's kiss, she has become the leader of the Brotherhood Without Banners and has changed their mission ever so slightly. Instead of a noble band of outlaws helping out when they can, the Brotherhood has become a guerrilla army of butchers and hunters, and their prey is Frey. Their crusade to bring justice for the Red Wedding has included the hangings of Peter, Ryman and Merit Frey, among many, many others. The Brotherhood has a new mission statement, which we hear from Lem Lemoncloak being told to Brienne of Tarth. She wants her son alive, or the men who killed him dead, said the big man. She wants to feed the crows, like they did at the Red Wedding. Frey's and Bolton's eye will give her those, as many as she likes. All she asks from you is Jamie Lannister. Did you catch that? Lem says that she wants her son alive, or the men who killed him dead. The presumption that he and the reader makes is that since Rob is dead, then the only option is to kill everyone involved at the Red Wedding, which is what they've been doing. But there's another option that is blown right past in the text, Rob Stark alive. It's unclear why this isn't being entertained more as a possibility since Lem is literally talking about Catelyn Stark who was resurrected by Beric Dondarrion who himself was resurrected by Thoros six times. If they could find his corpse, it's a real possibility that Rob could be brought back to the world of the living the same as his mother. Of course, the main problem here is that you have to find the corpse of Rob Stark, which is a bit of a challenge to keep track of post the Red Wedding. Immediately after the massacre, the Freys are feeling in high spirits about their mega betrayal and decide they should do something special to mark the occasion other than tossing the naked corpse of Catelyn into the river. That's something special? Mutilating Rob's corpse. So you sewed his head on Rob Stark's neck after both of them were dead, said Yellow Cloak. My father did that. All I did was drink. You wouldn't kill a man for drinking. Merritt remembered something then. Something that might be the saving of him. That was as cruel a jape as the crown the phrase had placed atop the head of Rob Stark's direwolf after they'd sewn it onto his headless corpse. A fairly brutal thing to do. And then what happened afterwards is that King Joffrey decided that he wanted Robb Stark's decapitated head playing to serve it cooked for Sansa at her wedding to his uncle Tyrion. The king turned to Grand Maester Pycelle, and I want Robb Stark's head too. Write to Lord Frey and tell him. The king commands. I'm going to have it served to Sansa at my wedding feast. And that's really the last we hear of Robb Stark's remains in the books. Joffrey does not get his wish of being sent Rob's head, and it's never mentioned again. If the Freys still have any part of Rob Stark, they're not talking. When they show up in White Harbor, they're trying to forge a marriage alliance to the Manderleys, and a key part of that is making Rob out as a villain of the Red Wedding. They make up stories about how they were attacked first by the Northmen, and that Rob turned into a giant menacing wolf. However, we are told a fascinating tidbit about what the Freys did with the valuable corpses afterwards. They've been saving them. I sent him back a raven to say that I would bend my knee and open my gates after my son was returned, but not before. There the matter stood when Tywin died. Afterward, the phrase turned up with Wendell's bones to make a peace and seal it with a marriage pact, they claimed. But I was not about to give them what they wanted until I had Wyllis, safe and whole, and they were not about to give me Wyllis till I proved my loyalty. Before they attacked Rob and his men, the phrase ahead of time worked out exactly who they would kill and who would they keep alive as hostages. Some, like Wendell Manderley, had its corpse set aside and preserved specifically 
to try and sell back to Lord Manderley as a bargaining chip. Given how they already marked Rob's body as special and paraded around like a trophy, it's very possible they didn't want the good times to ever end. The fate of Rob's head and or body is a permanent trophy of House Frey. Which shouldn't be that surprising. In A Feast for Crows, we learn that Ryman Frey managed to secure a trophy from Rob's corpse before his own untimely hanging. Sir Ryman came stomping up the gallows steps in company with a straw-haired slattern as drunk as he was. Her gown laced up the front, but someone had undone the laces to the navel, so her breasts were spilling out. They were large and heavy, with big brown nipples. On her head, a circlet of hammered bronze sat askew, graven with runes and ringed with small black swords. On the head of Ryman's lady friend is none other than the crown of the north made for Rob Stark by Hoster Tully. Poor Rob lost it when he lost his head, and Ryman managed to keep it for himself. Now Ryman, despite being quite a doofus, is the heir to the lordship of House Frey after his father Stevron's death. Makes sense that he got high priority on souvenirs from the dead king. If he got the crown at the second overall pick, then we can assume that his grandfather Walder got his pick of what he wanted from Rob. And knowing Walder's love of revenge and that the head swap was his idea, I'm guessing that Walder took the King of the North's corpse as his prize. His letter to Joffrey as well makes it clear that he considers Rob's body a trophy. Rosalind caught a fine fat trout, the message read. Her brothers gave her a pair of wolf pelts for her wedding. Many times throughout real and fictional history, the body parts of vanquished foes are kept as a point of pride, like Gregor Clegane's head being sent to Doran as a gift, or the skulls of the warrior's sons being collected by Magor the Cruel during his war on the Faith of the Seven. Ned Stark's head was put on a spike outside of Magor's holdfasts as a trophy by Joffrey before being returned by Tyrion. It's also rumored that the Wildlings drink from human skulls, and their strange tales from the Far East. Amongst the slain was Lobu himself, the 43rd and last of the Scarlet Emperors. When his severed head was presented to Zia, she commanded that the flesh be stripped from the bone, so that his skull might be dipped in gold and made into her drinking cup. From that time to this, every Jatar of the Jogos Nai has drunk fermented source milk from the gilded skull of the boy too bold by half as Lobu is remembered. Now we haven't heard from Lord Walder or seen within the twins since the Red Wedding, so it's possible that Rob Stark was given the Lobu or Ned Stark treatment. Remember, it's the phrase themselves that mark desecrating Rob's corpse as an important symbol of their victory. Keep the body itself or just the head and they could relive their greatest victory over and over and over. So that gets us part of the way to a risen King of Winter, that there's a pretty good chance Rob's body and or head are still being held somewhere in the twins by Lord Walder himself. And Catelyn would have more motivation than anyone to see her slain son return from the dead. But does this seem to be a goal of Lady Stoneheart? Has she and her band of killers been trying to achieve this or even looking for his body? And I submit there's good reason to think so. The Brotherhood and their questioning of Merit Frey demonstrate they are aware that after the Red Wedding, that Rob and Greywen were sewed together and paraded around. In the quote previously, Lem offers the information as a pointed question about if Merritt was a part of the sewing in any way. Merritt denies it, however, it's a curious question. The rest of the questions are getting at who was the brains behind the Red Wedding itself and then who exactly did what. Merritt costs off the information that Walder, Ryman, and Roos Bolton did the majority of the planning, while it was Walder's idea to stitch the King and Wolf together. You can imagine that Lady Stoneheart wants to know who did that in particular to an extra punishment, but the questions could serve another purpose, trying to get at who would know what happened to Rob's body afterwards. Merritt doesn't know anything about it, so they move on, by that I mean hanging him. But their next target is very, very interesting. Ryman Frey, after seizing River Run from the Blackfish with Jamie Lannister's help, is caught while traveling by mysterious bandits and found hanging from a tree, although no one is sure who did it, with the Freys actually accusing each other. That mystery is cleared up in Brienne's chapter when Lady Stoneheart has retrieved a particular item from Ryman and his queen. A trestle table had been set up across the cave in a cleft in the rock. Behind it sat a woman all in grey, cloaked and hooded. In her hands was a crown, a bronze circlet ringed by iron swords. She was studying it, her fingers stroking the blades as if to test their sharpness. Her eyes glimmered under her hood. Grey was the color of the Silent Sisters, the handmaidens of the stranger. Brienne felt a shiver climb her spine. Stoneheart. 
Not only has Rob's crown been recovered by his mother, given the example of how they squeezed every last piece of information from Merritt Frey before his hanging, Lady Stoneheart has now interrogated one of the three primary architects of the Red Wedding. We can assume that he probably told them everything before his death, including where Rob Stark's remains currently are. And if anyone knows, it would be Ryman. This whole encounter is fascinating because George chooses to put it off page so that we can guess what Ryman may have said, but we don't really know for sure. It allows him to cloak Stoneheart's knowledge and intentions moving forwards from the reader. So let's assume that Ryman told the Brotherhood that Walter kept Rob's corpse and that is being held in the Twins. That doesn't really help them. The Twins is a massive fortified castle that you can't just sneak into. Now this is where the theory of the Red Wedding 2.0 comes in. If you've never heard of it, this theory, going back years and years at this point, proposes that the Brotherhood Without Banners and Stoneheart are planning a revenge Red Wedding on the Freys and Lannisters. As it turns out, there's a wedding upcoming to seal the alliance between houses Frey and Lannister as payment for Walder's service. Davin Lannister, cousin to Jaime and Tyrion, is set to wed a member of House Frey, although it's not known which one. It's expected to be a merry affair, with all available members of House's Frey and Lannister attending as a massive party in celebration of their victory. It's suggested that this wedding will be taking place most likely at River Run, but possibly the Twins, and that Walder himself is expected to be in attendance. With Jaime Lannister captured by the end of A Dance with Dragons perhaps as a way inside the castle, some possible help from the Freys looking to take out their own competition, and their agent Tom 07s having infiltrated the castle, the stage is set for bloody vengeance. The reins of Castamir playing once again, but this time for the Lannisters and Freys themselves, as Mother Merciless extracts her revenge one drop of blood at a time. Let's not stop there though, and go back to Catelyn's desire that her son be alive or all those who participated in the Red Wedding killed. After getting her vengeance and River Run running red with the blood of her victims, what would she do if she found Rob's body and head? Could she pass on the fire of life that Beric Dondarrion gave her to her slain oldest child, restore him to life, reversing the Red Wedding and giving up her own life for her son as she tried to bargain with Walder before her death? On my honor as a Tully, she told Lord Walder. On my honor as a start, I will trade your boy's life for Rob's, a son for a son. Her hand shook so badly she was ringing Jingle Bell's head. Boom, the drum sounded. Boom, doom, boom, doom. The old man's lips went in and out. The knife trembled in Catelyn's hand, slippery with sweat. A son for a son, huh? He repeated. But that's a grandson, and he never was much use. There's some very strange foreshadowing as well that Rob may return to life. A glaring hint that the Red Wedding was coming came from, of all places, Daenerys Targaryen. In A Clash of Kings, Danny is visiting the House of the Undying in Carth, and they give her their favorite liquid acid, Shade of the Evening, and the Dragon Queen sees wild and terrifying visions. One though stands out as it shows her the aftermath of the Red Wedding. Farther on, she came upon a feast of corpses. Savagely slaughtered, the feasters lay strewn across overturned chairs and hacked trestle tables, a sprawl in pools of congealing blood. Some had lost limbs, even heads. Severed hands clutched bloody cups, wooden spoons, roast fowl, heels of bread. In a throne above them sat a dead man with the head of a wolf. He wore an iron crown and held a leg of lamb in one hand as a king might hold a scepter, and his eyes followed Danny with mute appeal. All the rest of the Stark's forces are dead and cut to pieces, the corpses left where the Freys and Lannister blades cut them down. All except one, the Wolf King, dead man with his iron crown and leg of lamb. That is clearly meant to be Rob Stark after he's been head swapped with Greywind. However, there's something different about him versus everyone else. He's still upright, holding his leg of lamb while his eyes see and follow Danny asking for help. An extremely strange scene, especially when you consider that most think after his death, Rob Stark took on a brief second life in Greywind as his last words were the name of his wolf. This suggests that George may not be done with the King of the North. Another odd bit of foreshadowing comes from Jon Snow, a particularly wild dream. 
In a dance with dragons, John dreams that he's defending the wall on his own against the other's attack. Many times in the books, John dreams of Rob and has vivid memories of their interactions as children. This one, though, has an odd connotation considering that Catelyn may be seeking Rob's resurrection. John was armored in black ice, but his blade burned red in his fist. As the dead men reached the top of the wall, he sent them down to die again. He slew a gray beard and a beardless boy, a giant, a gaunt man with file teeth, a girl with thick red hair. Too late, he recognized Ygritte. She was gone as quick as she'd appeared. The world dissolved into red mist. John stabbed and slashed and cut. He hacked down Dalonoi and gutted Deaf Dick Follard. Corrin Halfhand stumbled to his knees, trying in vain to staunch the flow of blood from his neck. I am the Lord of Winterfell, John screamed. It was Rob before him now, his hair wet with melting snow. Longclaw took his head off. So the characters mentioned are Night's Watch brothers and those beyond the wall like Egret. Yet Rob stands out as a strange inclusion. John's dream is about him fighting a one-man Thermopylae against the whited hordes of his friends and lover. It makes sense that John fears they will rise from the grave and be forced to destroy them, but Rob? As far as John knows, Rob's body is in the Riverlands and probably lost to a shallow grave, and yet he shows up on the other side of the wall, on the side of the undead. And Rob appears last in the dream, like the final boss before John awakes. Between Danny and John, a curious question arises. Why would two characters separated by continents and years both be having dreams of visions of Rob being among the undead? Maybe like how the ghost of High Heart saw Lady Stoneheart coming in her dreams well in advance, a white king may be next. One other oddity to all this that comes directly back to Stoneheart's meeting with Brienne of Tarth in the hollow Weirwood Caves. Brienne is introduced earlier on in A Feast for Crows to the odd fellow Nimble Dick Crab, and one of his favorite stories is of the great hero Clarence Crab and his castle at the Whispers. The Whispers is a name for the strange sound the waves make crashing on the rocks beneath it, but Dick tells a different tale, a dark one of chopped off heads and necromancy. His wife was a woods witch. Whenever Sir Clarence killed a man, he'd fetch his head back home, and his wife would kiss it on the lips and bring it back to life. Lords they were, and wizards, and famous knights and pirates. One was King O'Duskendale. They gave Old Crab good counsel. Being they was just heads, they couldn't talk real loud, but they never shut up neither. When you're a head, talking's all you got to pass the day. So Crab's Keep got named The Whispers. Still is, though it's been a ruin for a thousand years. A lonely place, The Whispers. A woods witch who kisses heads and brings them back to life so they can talk, just like they were in the head museum in Futurama. Considering Arya's question previously about resurrecting a body without a head, it seems like George is setting up the idea that at some point someone who lost their head will be returning from the grave. Also, think back to the name of the red priest ritual that brought Beric Dondarrion back to life over and over. The Last Kiss. Seems strange for George to be bringing that up once. Maybe it's a weird tale. But no, he keeps bringing it up. This woman, Stoneheart, Lord Beric's lover, according to one tale, supposedly she was hanged by the phrase, but Dondarrion kissed her and brought her back to life. Now she cannot die no more than he can. It certainly seems like we're leading up to the idea that Lady Stoneheart is going to give her own last kiss to someone and pass on the fire of life once her task is done. Once all of those who participate in the Red Wedding have paid for their crimes, maybe Catelyn Stark will rest again, but not before giving her son one last kiss. And if she does, what would she be creating? An undead monster stitched together? If all that can be found of Rob is just a head, would he become like the heads at the Whispers? And also like how Lady Stoneheart is a vengeance-driven hate machine after experiencing a profound betrayal in her final moments, if Rob returns, he won't be the same person that fell to Roose Bolton's knife. Rob was shot full of arrows, stabbed by his own bannermen, watched his friends and brothers in arms slain before him. His entire world came crashing down. And not only that, if Walter still has his body, it would very likely be in a great state of decay. One way that decapitated heads are preserved in Westeros for long periods of time is they dunk them in tar to stop the decomposition. That's an appealing image for sure. He would be an undead horror, a mockery of life itself, a corpse king 
or said another way, a king of night. Many have noted that while the Night King exists in Game of Thrones as a real character, there has been no leader of the others noted in the book so far. The Night King of legend is just that, a legend. And there have been attempts to find who will stand in for this endgame villain of A Song of Ice and Fire's third act. A very popular choice is Euron Greyjoy, who seems to think he will become a dark god somehow in the coming book. However, what if it is instead an actual king of night? who has been to the Nightlands and returned. Someone who has been betrayed in the most egregious way, born again by his mother, not into life, but into undeath. The Legend of the Night King features an odd detail. A woman was his downfall. A woman glimpsed from atop the wall, with skin as white as the moon and eyes like blue stars. Fearing nothing, he chased her and caught her and loved her, though her skin was cold as ice. And when he gave his seed to her, he gave his soul as well. We already see in the current story that the relationship between Beric and Lady Stoneheart has grown from the right of the last kiss into a romantic relationship and gossip. Give it a few thousand years and maybe the tale is so corrupted that a life-giving magical rite becomes a sexual relationship as well. And the same could be true for Rob and Kat if her identity is never revealed and hundreds of generations passed. What starts as a reloric last kiss becomes an undead woman creating a great historical evil. Lady Stoneheart wants her son alive. Catelyn may very well get both of her wishes in the winds of winter. Her son alive again and the men who killed him dead. It has always been said by the Starks of Winterfell that the others will return one very cold day. Mayhaps the cold winds rise and the King of Winter will rise to meet them. Winter is coming.